episode of the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Smolski, joined, as always, by my co-host, Scott Pianowski. Uh, it's a lovely Wednesday afternoon. We've got baseball already on today. Uh, we've got some call-ups to talk about. Scott and I are going to talk mainly pitching today. Um, we're going to look at some of the pitchers who have seen the largest increase in strikeout rate and whiff rate and tell you who we're buying into and who we're not, some guys who have seen the biggest decreases. Uh, so a lot of strikeouts today, a lot of strikeout talk. We love strikeouts. Um, Scott, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. Yeah, excited for today. Excited for – there's always something new, right? I mean, you know, Jackson Holiday was the guy last week. Jack Leiter is the guy this week. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, um, in between the elbow injuries and the you know, the Yelich and the Albies of the IL stuff, there's a lot of guys playing and playing exciting baseball I'm looking forward to talking about. Yeah, and we we kind of discussed the Yelich component last week when it was rumored that that he was going to go on. Um, obviously, the big news, as you mentioned, Jack Leiter is coming up. Um, Jack Leiter, who was the second overall pick in the 2021 draft, uh, kind of stumbled a little bit in his professional uh, two professional seasons um, in 2022, 2023. Didn't record an ERA under five uh, at any level for the Rangers. Um, however, they tweaked his mechanics um, in the offseason to try to get better command for him because they felt like the command um, was what was really impacting the results and not the stuff so much. Um, through three appearances at AAA so far this year, uh, 14 and a third innings, 11 hits, six earned runs. But the big thing here, 25 strikeouts to just three walks um, in AAA. It seems right now like this is a case of the Rangers play 17 straight games, um, and so they needed an extra starting pitcher um, with Cody Bradford heading to the IL, and so they're going to go to a six-man rotation um, with Leiter coming up. And, you know, he gets two, maybe three starts here during this run of games, and could he stick in the rotation afterwards? Sure, depending on on how he looks. Um, but given that there's a risk that this is kind of a short-term thing, Scott, what are you, how are you approaching it for in fantasy leagues? Yeah, I would like to get lighter in certain medium and deeper formats. And if I don't get them, that's okay. But it comes down to a couple of things. The pedigree second overall pick his father, Al lighter was a a great pitcher and and one of my favorite fantasy players, also a really good analyst too. So I, I like not, not just the pedigree of what Leiter did at Vanderbilt, but the fact that his father's uncles, you know, they're all major league baseball pitchers Mm -hmm. and that walk strikeout, right. Right. That I, for all the great stats and you do some unbelievable work with getting granular with baseball data. The first thing I'm always looking at is always going to be that walk strikeout, right. And when I see anybody with 25 strikeouts, three walks at 14 in the third innings, even if Leiter didn't have a pedigree, that would put my ears, you know, pin my ears up and get me interested. So look, here's the bottom line with this stuff, right? I, I know ideally the Rangers are probably like, okay, comes up, makes a couple of starts, everybody gets healthy, and then he goes back down. But we know how fluid every every team's rotation is. The days right. of like, oh, okay, he, these are our five starters. They're all going to make 32 starts. That doesn't happen anymore. Every team yeah. needs to go eight or 10 deep. And they, you, you over, it, it's kind of like how, you know, Georgia will over recruit a quarterback. You know, we need to have multiple guys and we'll just figure out who's healthy and who's good. The other guys will hit the transfer portal. I mean, it's kind of what baseball does. You know, we look at the Dodgers, right? They stock their rotation. We'll see who's healthy. We'll see who's good. We'll see who isn't good. And and we'll roll with those guys. So I, I, bottom line, when you're picking up guys, especially with pitching, right? We're all searching for pitching. We all have pitchers who are hurt. We all have pitchers who are underperforming. We're trying to find plausible upside. Is there plausible upside with Jack Leiter? Unquestionably, yes. So I'm going to make sure, and, and this is kind of my FOMO rule on guys like this, I'm going to make sure I have Jack Leiter somewhere. So if he pops, sure. at least one of my teams will benefit. Yeah, and I think this is like, look, the two guys that are ahead of him in the rotation right now are Dane Dunning and Michael Lorenzen, both of whom have had success out of the bullpen in the past. And so if Leiter looks good enough that the Rangers are like, oh, we'd like to keep him up here. Like, there's no reason that they can't move Dunning or or Lorenzen to the pen. Um, but just, you know, he's going to start against the Tigers this week. Pretty solid landing spot. Um, be, you know, cautious in your bids, just acknowledging that this might not be um, a, a real long-term thing. Um, we should note also uh, the Dodgers made more than a few call-ups, um, two of which were, were pitchers. 
Um, the Dodgers called up Kyle Hurt, um, who uh, operated out of um, as kind of like a, in a little bit of like an opener um, yesterday. He threw the first uh, two innings of the game before Yarborough came in. Uh, two innings, three hits, uh, no runs, no strikeouts, no walks. Um, and then they are going to call up Landon Knack uh, for later in this week, um, also against the Nationals. Uh, I, we talked before about like the Dodgers do this kind of stuff. They, you know, they call up guys, they see, you know, who is looking good. They, you know, give guys a break here or there. Uh, we know Bobby Miller is down in the short term. I, I find it hard to believe that either Landon Knack or Kyle Hurt will fight into the rotation full time. Uh, just for some quick numbers, Landon Knack. Um, has thrown 15 and two-thirds innings in AAA with a 4.02 ERA, 16 strikeouts uh, to four walks, um, and has allowed 11 hits. Kyle Hurt, um, who uh, was primarily – he made one start in AAA and uh, two – oh, sorry, this is uh, – in he made two starts in AAA, but only thrown four innings, eight strikeouts, four walks. Um, he's already made three appearances for the Dodgers, um, only one start, and that was the two-inning thing we saw yesterday. So it feels like he's kind of a multi-inning guy. Are you interested in either of these players for right now? No, they need to pitch their way into my roster. The yeah. the guy in the Dodgers rotation, and I realize this isn't actionable, who I got my eye on right now is Walker Bueller, who has that Thursday rehab start. And if that goes well, it sounds like he might be in the rotation next week. He might even make two starts next week, and one of them would be a Washington start, which we always love that. Uh, the second start would be against Arizona, which would be more challenging. But um, I think both of these – I don't think either the or Hurt or Knack have long-term potential unless they really pitch lights out. I, the Dodgers have just so much talent in front of them. Granted, we'll, we'll see what James Paxton winds up doing. He walked eight guys at his last start. Right. This is a hard game to watch, but – um, I think these are just band-aids. I don't, I don't think the team even sees any significant upside with either one of these two guys. I agree with you. Um, I'm far more interested in the outfielder they called up, Andy Pajes, um, who made his start, uh, his debut last night starting in the outfield. Um, so far in AAA this year, he was hitting 371 with five home runs, 15 RBIs, two steals in 15 games. Uh, the big thing for him, if you're following a lot of prospect writers on Twitter, the big thing has been his increased contact rate, uh, both overall and in the zone. Um, his strikeout rate was just 17.8% uh, so far in AAA. Now, acknowledging that like last year in AA, his strikeout rate was 22.5% and had a 17.6% walk rate. So this isn't somebody who had a lot of swing and miss in his game. But this is somebody who was making gains in terms of his overall strikeout rate. Um, last year, only played 33 games because uh, he was hurt. But in 2022, hit 26 home runs with six steals. In 2021, hit 31 homers with six steals. There is some power here. Um, hits from the right side of the plate. So who knows? You know, the Dodgers do like to platoon. He did start against the lefty last night. So it's hard to know for sure. But look. Chris Taylor is not playing really well. With Jason Hayward out, they're getting a lot of Taylor Trammell, who's probably not a MLB starting outfielder. Enrique Hernandez is, is great as like your Swiss Army knife that you can move all around, but probably shouldn't be an everyday starter. It feels like there's maybe a path here for Pajes, who is a top 100 prospect, to get some playing time and potentially carve out a, a full-time role or like a 75% role on the Dodgers. Are, are you interested in this? I am. Um, you always ask yourself, okay, well, who are the best lineups in baseball? You know, the Braves, the Dodgers, you know, probably the Astros, the Rangers, stuff like that. You can't roster their guys because they're usually well over the 50% threshold that we would even talk about them. But here's right. Pa has you know, signed as a 17 year old. I mean, he's been the minors for a while, 262, 381, 527 slash. He's got great on base skills. And you mentioned Taylor and Hernandez. And, and I know the Dodgers, you know, Dave Roberts, I was always seemed to like Enrique Hernandez. And he's had a couple of tours of duty with the team. And Chris Taylor's a nice player. But those are guys, a team that has the aspirations of the Dodgers, I don't think 
Taylor or Hernandez should be everyday players. I think they should be the, the you want to use one of them as a super utility role and the other guys on the bench. They both shouldn't be starting. I feel like they have to be open to the upside of somebody else, whether it's, it's Pahez popping in his age 23 season or eventually they make a trade for somebody. But I feel like there's a spot available. And I don't think the Dodgers, line, as much as we talk about it, and that one, two, three is, is just hits you, right? With Mookie and Otani and Freeman. That's great. And, you know, Will Smith just signed the big extension. You know, Teoscar Hernandez was a nice pickup. I don't think they have the length of some other offenses. I actually think the Dodgers, uh, the Braves right now have the best lineup, even with Ozzy Al- Albies getting hurt. Yeah. So anytime I can see a chance that I could pick up a guy who has a path to, if it pops, you know, maybe Paz is a regular for this team, even if it only happened for a month or two, and he was like a, a league average player, just being in a good right. offensive environment, he has skills that translate. You say he has power. He, he will steal a base here and there. He can get on base. So I'm interested, and it's when I say interested, you, you this is the type of player you can probably watch him play a little bit before you pick yeah. him up. It's not like there's some stampede to get him. I'm sure his right. roster tag in Yahoo is just about nothing right now. But whenever you can find an on ramp to a Braves player, to a Dodgers player, and you can sell yourself on his skills or on his resume a little bit, yeah, sure, I'm interested. Yeah, and, uh, DJ Short and I talked about this yesterday on our our Q and A, uh, which is every Tuesday on the NBC Sports YouTube page. You should, you guys should definitely check that out. We talked about like the Dodgers might be looking at what Michael Bush do, is doing right now, and like eh, you know maybe we should have uh, maybe we should have you know given him more of a shot here. And I don't know that that's going to lead them to give Pajes more of a chance, but. It would be foolish to think they're not noticing that they essentially sold low on a guy, you know, who, yeah, they got a decent pitching prospect back who's young, but like Bush maybe could really help them right now in their lineup. And maybe they'll give Pajas a chance to do that. Um, you mentioned wanting exposure to the Braves lineup or the Dodgers lineup. Um, I guess I'll question how deep your your need for, ha- for Braves exposure is. We know that Ozzy Albies is on the IL. He has a fracture of his big toe. Uh, Braves beat writers reported after the game last night that he had already ditched his protective boot and was walking around without a limp, um, which might suggest that it's not a, um, there had been some question about like whether it's a fully displaced fracture or whatever could impact the timeline. This seems like something that could be just like two to four weeks for him um, until he obviously is without pain. The big toe, as we know, is like a big balance thing, which is important for, for hitting. Um, they called up David Fletcher, but Luis Guillorme has been starting at second base. I, I can't imagine you're going to want to pick up Fletcher or Guillorme. I feel like the only thing that really changes here is Michael Harris is hitting second in the lineup, which is good for his value, but you're not picking him up anywhere. So it feels like there's nothing really actionable here. You probably not I actually wrote about the Braves today a little bit sheepishly because I know – even though they lead the majors in runs per game, all the slash stats, which of course means they lead in OPS as well. They also are the runaway leaders in BABIP. But how do you add Braves, right? I mean, it's just hard to. Right. I do think the two things maybe you could do here, I'm, I'm not saying this is definitely possible, but Michael Harris, because his production has been a little bit muted, gets that bump in the in the order. We'll see how long it sticks. Eventually, Albies will come back and Harris will go in the middle of the lineup, which is still a good place to be. At least he's not batting ninth like he did pretty much all of last season. But I wonder if Harris's slow start could make him somebody to target as a mild buy low. Nobody's giving up on Harris. Whoever drafted Harris in your league, I'm sure, believes in him. But I would still just see if that's out here, out there. And also, Arcia, I think he's an underrated part of this offense. Yeah. He's, he's going to hit for a playable average. He had 17 home runs last year in less than a full season. And his roster tag on Yahoo is about 25 or 30%, something like that. The other regular in this offense that isn't over 50% and he's not close to it is Kelnick. Unfortunately, he's in a platoon. And even though he's hitting over 400, all of his under the hood stats said you know, he's incredibly lucky. He should be hitting like 270. He's not running right now. And he, when he does play, he will bet seventh, eighth, or ninth, depending on who's around him in the lineup. So um, it's hard to find access the players here. I do think Arcia is an interesting guy to get. I do think it might be right to just kick the tires on a Harris trade, although I'm not confident necessarily that will work in every league, but maybe that'd be somebody who's just a little bit frustrated that Harris hasn't been smashing. But for the most part, any piece of this offense you can get, I'm invested. I'm interested. Yeah. In deep in deeper leagues like the Guillaume types are, are interesting. Um we had another prospect call up uh due to an injury and that was unfortunately <laughs> Seiya Suzuki mm-hmm. Landed on the IL uh, with an oblique injury. Right now, 
The Cubs are saying it's about a four-week timeline. We've seen Seiya Suzuki battle of weak injuries before. Um, it delayed his season last year, and it took him a while to get back to being the hitter that, you know, it really wasn't until August that he, like, really turned it on um, last year. I'm kind of thinking this might be more a six- to eight-week thing, and who knows what Suzuki is going to be like when he comes back. You're not dropping Seiya Suzuki. You should be putting him on the IL. Um, but it is just a concern because I think we were hoping for that kind of breakout year. The Cubs called up Alexander Canario, um, who is a power first prospect for them. He hit 37 home runs in 2022. Uh, he got into a pretty big um, collision at first base playing in the Dominican Republic over the winter prior to the 2023 season. Uh, where he suffered um, a fractured ankle, a dislocated shoulder. It caused him to miss a lot of time in, in 2023. This is a guy with big-time power, but also big-time swing and miss as a corner outfield prospect. Um, it's a little bit of like if you if Patrick Wisdom was a corner outfielder, where like, yeah, the power is good and he can hit for a, a lot of – he can hit out of any ballpark, but he could also swing and miss a ton. He started in his debut because he's a right-handed hitter. They were facing a lefty. We might get a lot of Mike Taukman starting because Mike Taukman is a left-handed hitter. Are you intrigued enough by Canario to try to buy in on his power, or is this a situation where you're just not sure he's going to play enough? Yeah, I'm just afraid Taukman's there and is going to chew up a lot of times. This could be a quasi-platoon. Canario's an interesting guy. I mean, you mentioned the big-time power from somebody who just lists as 5'11", 165. That's not unusual on the Cubs. Christopher Morel's a little bit slighter of build, and he's turned into a great power hitter. And before that ankle injury, Canaro was actually running a lot in the minor leagues. He's kind of shut that down since the ankle injury. And I would think those two things are probably related. I'm just, it's hard for me. Most of our audience, I'm sure, is playing in like the 10 team, 12 team mixed league format. And right. you really need guys to play every day for that to be relevant, for players to be relevant. So this is another guy who would have to hit his way off the waiver wire onto my roster. And if I get beat in a couple of leagues, uh, you know, to people who are making proactive pickups, I can live with that. Yeah, I will say uh, the Cubs just put out their lineup for today, Wednesday the 17th, and Canario is not in mm -hmm. the lineup. Uh, Taukman is in right field, and Miles Mastroboni is in left field. Um, and, you know, Ian Happ is DHing. But so they had a chance to get him in against the righty. They're not currently. So this might be a short side platoon uh, situation for now. I just want to underscore this is probably painfully obvious to anybody who's a good fantasy player, but. What you're doing is what everybody should do when there's injuries. You should be grinding all the lineups anyway. But whenever a team lost a major piece and they've made a you know a significant call up or they've changed their roster construction, what is the lineup? Who's in? Who's out? What does it look like versus different handedness? Who's moving up right. in the lineup? Stuff like that. Just like whenever there's a closer situation in flux, like we knew Jose Leclerc was going bad you know, is it going to be robertson is it going to be yates who's pitching against what part of the order you want to when a change is imminent or a change has happened you want to pay a special close detail to what the team does right. again a lot of times what they say doesn't matter it's what they do it's what and here's do. the flip side of it the dodgers put out their lineup and pajes is in the lineup mm -hmm. um, against a right-handed pitcher he's playing right field so he played center field against the lefty when James Outman sat, and now against the righty, Outman is back in the lineup, but they are playing Pajes in right field. Um, and so that that had been um, – and they moved Teoscar Hernandez to left field. So that had been where Chris Taylor and Enrique Hernandez were playing, left field. But it looks like Teoscar to left field, Pajes to right field could be the situation we're looking at with the Dodgers – um, that makes me more interested in Pajes because I think this might be a near everyday opportunity for him. Uh, we want to get in on that. I love, I just uh, love when lineups come out. It just, I just love grinding the new lineups, man. I, and especially now, I feel like with the National League DH that adds more in, intrigue to the National League lineups. And there's a lot of teams that are platooning now, which can be a pain in the neck for fantasy, but we have to try to you know, figure out that stuff and put the puzzle together. There's so much to be gleaned by what, again, the usage. This is what usage is, right? Football, we're always talking about usage. Where are the touches going? Who's being used at the goal line? All this stuff. Right. You know, baseball is all about usage too. What what relievers pitch against what part of the lineup? And um, what do you do when the primary guys aren't available? And how do teams reshuffle the deck when they lose a major player like a Yelich or like an Albies? So this is 
these are the skills that you need to be a better fantasy player. So everything, all the things that you're doing and you're outlining here, I, I hope people, even though they're probably wrote by now to anybody who's a good player, I just, this is what, this is the toolbox that makes you a good fantasy player. Yeah, uh, hopefully, and hopefully it works and helps us make good decisions. Um, two Red Sox notes. Mm -hmm. uh, Rafael Devers is headed for imaging on his knee. He felt knee discomfort um, on a play last night. Too early to speculate on that. Um, we have no idea. You know, discomfort is such a vague term that could mean anything from a serious knee injury to, hey, he just needs to rest for two days to like, hey, we'll, we'll shut him down for a couple weeks. Um, but just something for people to keep an eye on. And then Garrett Whitlock exited the start with oblique, uh, an oblique strain. We know that's going to sideline him. Obliques for pitchers um, are obviously tough. Uh, you know, the, there's you're not going to pick up anybody on the Red Sox. Uh, it might be Josh Winkowski into the rotation. It might be Cooper Criswell into the rotation. Uh, they already lost, you know, Lucas Giolito before the season started. Pavetta's on the shelf now. Stories out for the year. Whitlock has an oblique strain. We don't know what's going to happen with Devers. Um, it's tough right now for the Red Sox. Uh, we'll wait on the Devers news. I think it's safe to cut Whitlock in most leagues. Um, he'll be out for a few weeks, you know, four weeks probably. Uh, they haven't given an exact timeline, but obliques take a while. So I would expect at least a month. Um, and Whitlock was a fringe guy in 12-team leagues anyway. So I, I don't really think you need to be holding on to him. Yeah, this, this team's breaking my heart. I mean, the story injury, um, O'Neill gets hurt. Even someone like Cutter Crawford, who's got a 0.42 ERA, but he's getting no wins because he's getting pulled in the fourth or fifth inning or sixth inning in all of his starts. And you need to go deeper than that to have a decent chance at like the, the 13 to 15 wins I thought he legitimately had a chance for before the season. And the defense hasn't been as good as I thought it would be. I know no, Rafael, I still like long term, he hasn't hit it all so far, but it's just funny how they've had cluster injuries, especially at that pitching staff that we were we thought was a great bargain to, to attack yeah. any of these guys. And I look, it still may be. I mean, Bayo's been okay. Whitlock was pitching well before he got hurt. I still think Crawford's going to go down as a profit player, but it may be like, you know, an eight and seven season, even though he has great peripherals. But um, it's just, it, it's a, it's sad for me. Of course, you know, I'm burying the lead because you mentioned Dever. If Devers gets hurt, the whole offense takes a gigantic shot down because he's, he's the one front man you can't lose. I mean, he's U2 without Bono. Yeah, we're. I'm trying not to get into that sort of speculation because we we don't know right now. We'll, we'll for sure. For the best. Um, the last piece of news, you know, we've had a lot of elbow injuries for pitchers, and a lot of it has been tied to velocity. But Tyler Wells uh, for the Orioles now has some elbow inflammation, is on the IL. He is not a hard thrower. He's a command guy. Um, so again, you know, probably going back to workload and all the stuff we talked about with youth baseball and minor leagues and no off seasons and et cetera, but. Tyler Wells is out of the Orioles rotation for the time being. They've called up Albert Suarez. Um, what's interesting about this is that Suarez has no minor league options remaining. So by calling him up, if they want to send him down again, they need to put him on waivers. Um, this is a guy that was in the KBO last year. Um, he has not been in the major leagues, in a major league organization since 2018. But he kind of reinvented himself in the KBO. He looked pretty good in spring. Um, he's made one start in three appearances in AAA so far this year with a 587 ERA. But he has 17 strikeouts to just one walk in 15 and a third innings. Um, you know, the BABIP is super high right now. So that ERA is probably unlucky. We've talked about this before, right? 17 strikeouts to one walk in 15 innings is something that you know, peaks our interest, pitching for the Orioles peaks our interest, pitching in that park, which is now a pitcher's park, peaks our interest. I don't think we're running to pick up Albert Suarez, but I think if you're in deeper formats, watching his start could be interesting because if he looks like he's even just decent, then the rest, the other context around him could make him an interesting deep league, at least streamer. Right. Yeah. It sounds like he's pitching today against Minnesota. So this is, by the time you listen to this, you may have a better idea what to do with Suarez, but as you mentioned, a fascinating guy, he's already 34. He's bounced around. He hasn't pitched in, in MLB in what, seven years, I think it is, but um, Baltimore, we want to bet on that infrastructure. I also just want to mention with Tyler Wells, it always blows my mind when I watch him pitch and I see him warming up it's like, Oh, he's a six foot eight guy. He probably throws 102 and he throws like 92. 
Uh, I should say, actually, we're right in the middle of this. You mentioned uh, the twin start. That game has already started. Um, so far, Albert Suarez has retired six of the first seven twins um, he's faced. He's thrown 26 pitches. 18 are for strikes. Um, he's thrown uh, his four seam 20 times. He's gotten six whiffs on 13 swings already on his four seamer. We already talked about the fact that this is a twins lineup that um, doesn't has lost some teeth just to injuries. Um, but, you know, so far, so good for Albert Suarez. Uh, we'll check in at the end of the podcast. We'll look at his stats by the time Man, we're done. Is that twins lineup depressing? You know, I think the only thing worse than Byron Buxton getting hurt these days is Byron Buxton playing 204, 241, 315. Yeah, but those. The plays in center field, he looked uh, oh, great defender. He's when he's field. when he's healthy enough to play center field, it's a joy to watch him play. I realize that yeah. hasn't been recently, but I just he's going to go down as just one of those what could have been players, right? I mean, he was the number one. You know, we talk a lot about the difference between a prospect and the prospect. Byron Buxton was a cover boy prospect right. at one point, the guy. Yep. And I feel the like th- just it hasn't for a lot of mostly for injury reasons, although there's always been a lot of swing and miss in his game, but. That just underscores you look at this lineup. I mean, there's a bunch of guys in this lineup who you wouldn't even think of picking up for a fantasy team. So um, the AL Central is still the pillow landing for streaming. Yeah, there, there are a few uh, cover boy prospects or former cover boy prospects that we'll talk about when we get to pitchers um, who've seen the biggest strikeout rates increases. But before we do that, uh, the countdown is on today. Wednesday is the 100-day mark to the Summer Olympics in Paris. Uh, So tune in this summer on NBC and Peacock to see the greatest athletes in the world go for gold in the city of light. Again, 100 days till the Summer Olympics in Paris uh, only on NBC and Peacock. Uh, We already waxed poetic about the Olympics on our Monday show. Yes, we Uh, did. We'll we'll get right into this. Um, I went to the StatCast year-over-year changes. Um, I looked at both whiff rate and strikeout rate um, because I wanted to see pitches who are like seeing the biggest uptick in both stats. Obviously, strikeout rate um, is just the increase in actual strikeouts, the percentage of strikeouts from year to year. Whiff rate would be the increase in swings and misses um, from last year to this year. So I wanted to see both because sometimes you get guys who are increasing their whiff rate a lot but aren't seeing the increase in strikeouts, whether that's because of put-away pitches or something, but guys who are just missing more bats. Um, Quick hitter at the top, a guy we've talked about already. Reed Detmers, his strikeout rate is up 14.5% this year. That's the most of any starting pitcher in baseball. Um, You can go to NBCSports.com and look at uh, the baseball uh, articles. My weekly column, Mixing It Up, last week featured Reed Detmers, where I talked about his four-seam. His four-seam fastball has an increased IVB, which is is induced vertical break, uh, which is when the fastball seems to rise more, right? We talk a lot about, like, we used to say colloquially, like his fastball rises. Uh, obviously, the fastball doesn't rise, but it just defies gravity a little bit longer as it's heading to home plate. Um, if you're throwing fastballs up in the zone and they seem to stay up in the zone, they're obviously harder to hit, right? Um, Detmers is throwing more fastballs up in the zone. He's got uh, less gravity working on the fastball now. He's actually throwing out of the strike zone up more, uh, which is leading to more swings and misses up in the strike zone. Detmers is always a guy who had a fine fastball but relied on his secondaries. Detmer right now with a swing and miss fastball is seeing massive strikeout rate improvement. I buy it. Um, it is location dependent. He needs to make sure that fastball stays up in the zone um, and or preferably like slightly above the zone. Um, if it doesn't, he could start getting hit a little bit harder. But this is a very talented pitcher with a very clear change, and so I'm buying what what he's throwing right now. Yeah, I love that your pitch mix analysis lines up to what all the stats say. Any time somebody spikes their strikeout rate and also trims their walk rate, which was probably around league average last year, but now it's a little bit better than that. And you think whenever you see outlier stats, like a 1.04 ERA, People love to say, oh, well, yeah, well, what's the expected ERA? It's going to, you know, that's not going to line up. Well, his FIP is 1.46. His ex-FIP, he hasn't allowed a home run. That's still very good at 2.35. And the Sierra is uh, in that area, too. It's it's like the low two. So there's no real eureka moment. If somebody's hitting like 450, yeah, of course their BABIP is going to be huge. You can't have a great average without a great BABIP. But 
the fact that even the ERA estimators are like, yeah, Detmers is pitching like a Cy Young candidate. It's only three starts. But the other thing that backs this up, age 24 season, he with the 10th pick in his draft class. So there's a pedigree here. I don't have Reed Detmers anywhere, and this kills me. I, I've had him before in the past. I've, I've never yeah. been at the front of the Detmers bandwagon, but I've always had a seat on it. This year, I don't have a seat on it. And, and what can you do? You can't trade for him now. I mean, anybody who no. rosters Detmers is going to want the world for him. You have to probably sit it out, or you'll have to trade for him when he starts pitching poorly, and then you might not have the nerve to do it. But this is what a breakout season looks I know it's just three starts, and, and who knows? Maybe you listen to this podcast in July, and it will sound silly when we all talked about Reed <laughs> Detmers. But, Eric, I'll say this. I mean, I'm going to at some point set up the Friends and Family League, and we're going to redraft. And I guarantee yeah. you, Reed Detmers' ADP is going to drop, jump significantly. from. I, I would guess it was probably in the low to mid-200s preseason. may have been higher than that. I mean, he's going to he's gonna be drafted as like an SP3 in this draft, I bet. Yeah, I, I – He's, I have the same FOMO that you do. Uh, I had many shares in the past um, and it, it didn't work out and I don't have any this year. Um, what you just said about sometimes with like young pitchers like this, it, it, it takes a while and this is the breakout. I just want to mention a guy who we had further down on the list, but I think it applies to Mackenzie Gore as well. Mm -hmm. We talked about Mackenzie Gore at length on Monday's show. We talked about, as a waiver wire pickup, so you can go back and listen to that. Scott and I are both very in on Mackenzie Gore, another guy whose fastball location and performance have really improved and kind of carried the weight here. These are both young pitching prospects, right? Detmers is 24 years old. Mackenzie Gore is 25 years old. These are guys who were really well thought of, who didn't have consistently immediate success. And so we've kind of like backed off of them, but that doesn't mean they're not talented. Um, and we're starting to see that talent come through. So these are two guys I think you and I are both really in on. Um, and a good reminder that, like, if you believe in the talent of a young pitcher, you shouldn't totally write them off when they start to show that talent a couple of years later. Sometimes it takes a little while. Um, oh, for, sure. for sure. I mean, you look all you know, historically, right? I mean, Tom Glavin, look at that whole Braves rotation, right? Tom Glavin was knocked around his early part of his career. Greg Maddox was knocked around when he was on the Cubs for his first season or two. It, it takes a while for these guys to figure it out. The only thing you would like to see from Gore is for him to go deeper in games. And part of that is the double-edged sword you get with strikeouts because they chew up pitches. And then you end up leaving the game after five or five and two-thirds innings, which he's done pretty much all of his starts. But at least people are getting the memo that he's good and yeah, I know Look, you do it against Oakland. So what, but he still struck out 11 guys. Not everybody strikes out 11 in Oakland. He did stop the Phillies in that previous start. Uh, Mackenzie Gore. Thankfully I talked about not having Detmers. Thankfully I do have a healthy amount of Mackenzie Gore. And I think, I, I don't know if he's going to smash his ADP, but he's going to be, here's the bottom line. As long as your league is like 10 managers and up, Mackenzie Gore is going to be playable the whole season. This is yeah. going to be somebody you can rely on with the upside of maybe being, a significant needle mover. Even if he's not that, I think he'll be rosterable all season. So I'm glad that people have finally gotten the memo and he's been actively added over the last few days. Yeah, uh, fully agree. Uh, another young pitcher who's seen a, an increase um, in whiff rate uh, is Bryce Miller, uh, whose whiff, whiff rate is up 9.2%. Um, Bryce Miller, through three starts, has a 196 ERA and 098 whip. Um, he has seen just a little over a 1% increase um, in strikeout rate. His walk rate is up, um, but he's allowing less hard contact, getting more swings and misses. And a big reason for that is the introduction of a splitter. Uh, that was the big kind of like pitch mix change for him this year, the splitter. Um, the splitter has a 22% swinging strike rate. It is not allowing a lot of hard contact, um, but – like a, what a splitter does, um, you know, it's in the zone less than 40% of the time. He's throwing it a lot in two strike counts, but it's not getting a lot of swings and misses in two strike counts because people tend to know that splitters usually don't land in the strike zone. Um, so when you start to see them in counts where you are expecting something out of the strike zone, hitters can lay off. So that's why we're seeing increase in overall whiffs from Bryce Miller, but not in strikeouts. His fastball is still like elite and fastball is still missing a lot of bats and two strike counts. So I think this might be just kind of like him figuring out how to use his new arsenal. Um, but I, I was big on Bryce Miller heading into this year, not as like 
you know, he wasn't going to be George Kirby or Logan Gilbert, but I thought there was another level than what we saw last year. Um, I still agree with that. I, I think obviously this 196 ERA, I'm not fully buying into, but I think there will be an increase in strikeouts as the year goes on. I think this is a really solid pitcher who will end somewhere like in a mid three ZRA on a good team. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm what Bryce Miller's doing. Yeah, I like the way you finished that. We talked about a mid three ZRA because I think that's the reasonable projection here. We talked before the season, but why not just get all the Seattle pitchers? And I realize that hasn't been as much fun as we expected. Castillo's off to a poor start, and Kirby's had some up and down turns. We did see Gilbert pitch very well yesterday. The luck signs are flashing with Miller in a couple of areas. He's got a huge strand rate, and he's got a very low BABIP against, and those things are obviously correlated. That's always getting out of some of his jams. And the strikeout numbers aren't up to code. He's only striking out 8.35 per nine, not getting enough chases. That's the thing. You talk about the splitter. A lot of times batters are they, they're able to spit on that pitch because they see if it looks right. like a borderline pitch, don't swing in it because it's coming down. It's going to be out of the strike zone. Unless Angel Hernandez is behind the plate, that's probably a strike. <laughs> but um, as long as you have the key here is to just keep keep Miller in perspective. Again, he's playable. His year, you know, his that 1.96 year rate does not pass the under the hood stat test, you know, uh, FIP, X FIP, everything's going to push him into the mid to high threes right now. But in this environment, I look at a lot of my leagues right now. Even if your ERA is over four, you're probably in the median of your standings for whatever that means through two or three weeks. If I can find, if I can identify any pitcher who is on a decent team, is in a pitcher park, and Seattle's probably the best pitcher park in the American League, and I can tell myself that his reasonable projections in the ERA in the threes. That's a, that's a guy who's rosterable all season. Yeah. I, f- I fully agree with you there. Um, the next name surprised me. It's Graham Ashcraft. Mm-hmm. His whiff rate is up 7.7%. Um, I understand that like Ashcraft has been like, he's so often discussed because his name is at the top of stuff plus leaderboards all the time. Cause the slider and cutter grayed out really well, but his, his stats haven't been, great um he's seeing a real uptick in strikeout uh strikeout rate this year as well um so his swinging strike rate is up uh, almost four percent but he has a 25.3 percent strikeout rate this year it was at 18 percent last year so over seven percent increase in strikeout rate a lot of that has to do now with like with he's using a sinker um graham ashcraft is a guy that i covered in my this week's article mixing it up which is out today on nbc sports and i mentioned that ashcraft was basically only throwing a sweeper and a cutter last year uh they both graded out well but when you're a right-handed hitter and you know that the pitcher doesn't have anything that he will throw inside to you all you do is look for the outer half of the plate and that's why ashcraft got crushed by righties historically because he didn't come inside to righties and so they looked for things out over the plate. They looked for things off the plate. And he didn't get the strikeouts that his stuff seemingly deserved. Now he's throwing sinkers more. And so he's getting more, uh, more strikeouts. However, I came away from that article feeling like it was a little bit of um, – I, I didn't really buy in. I think he had eight strikeouts in his last start against the White Sox. Um, That is not a particularly good offense. He had six strikeouts um, in the game before against the Brewers, but he also allowed five earned runs in five and two-thirds innings. His sinker command is way off. It's over the middle of the plate too much. This is not a guy that I – I'm still not buying into Graham Ashcraft. I think with the the use of the sinker, sure, he he could really beat up on bad offenses maybe more effectively than he did in the past. And if you want to stream him against the White Sox and the Nationals and the, you know, the Marlins or whoever, fine. But like, I don't think this is Graham Ashcraft finally making good on his stuff plus metrics. Yeah, I'm, I'm torn on Ashcraft. Um, before this season, I was just hands off because that strikeout rate, you just can't make it in baseball today unless you do everything else right if you don't strike guys out. Now, this year, he's got the strikeout rate in a good area and he's actually trimmed his control. And he's getting all those ground balls. These are all good things. But he's not, as you mentioned, the, the strikeout rate doesn't still measure. The stuff plus has always said that he should strike out guys. He doesn't strike out guys. And he's always going to have those Cincinnati starts to worry about. When you stream him, even against a weak opponent, he's going to have some starts at home where he allows seven runs. And then at that point, you have no nerve to start him the next time out. 
no matter who he's facing. I did add him in a few leagues, in a few deeper leagues, but I was afraid to pitch him this week. So it's kind of a wait and see for me. I do the the encouraging things, the swing strike rates up. The ground ball rate's always going to play nice with him. He has good control. And this year it's actually been elite control. I will see if he can keep the strikeouts. If he can keep the strikeout walk rate where at, at now, he would be rosterable. But I'm just worried that he's always going to allow some home runs. That it's been a problem for him his whole career, and Cincinnati is just such a good place to hit. So I can't give you. I gave you a very wishy-washy take on Grand Graham Ashcraft, but I think that's what his resume. You know, that's what it leads me to. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, an, another name I was surprised to see on here is Clark Schmidt. Um, whose whiff rate is up 7.1%. Clark Schmidt has a 368 ERA through three starts, uh, but a 164 whip. He has a 24.5% strikeout rate. Um, his swinging strike rate has jumped up to 13.1%. Um, that's pretty good. Like That is above average now. He was below average before. A lot of it is him leaning into the cutter more. The Yankees love the cutter, um, and it's working for him this year. But Clark Schmidt has always had uh, platoon splits. The cutter should help um, more against lefties. However, his last start against the Guardians, they have a very left-handed heavy lineup, and he was really kind of like cautious around the zone and not attacking the zone as much against those lefties, and he walked, I think it was six guys in that start. Um, and so, you know, you see that kind of, that same inconsistency with Clark Schmidt where he flashes the ability right? Uh, you know, five strikeouts and five and a third against the Astros in the first start. Uh, and you're like, okay, there's something here. There's something here. It, it has yet to click. Uh, the increased swing and miss is nice. And I'm still watching. I still want to believe. I still weirdly think like there's something here, but I, I, he's a streamer to me right now. Maybe in a deep league, I'm holding him on my bench because I think there's upside, but I can't play him against really good offenses or, or really left-handed heavy lineups. Yeah, I'll co sign all of that. The good news is he does get two starts next week, and one of them is against Oakland. I know the Baltimore start may concern us, but it's at Baltimore, which is, you know, that park does mitigate some of the offensive downside. So I'll sign off on the two-start step next week, but I think your measured take on Schmidt makes a lot of sense. Uh, the last starting pitcher we'll talk about is Ryan Weathers. Um he is not the converted reliever into starter on the Marlins we thought we'd be talking about. Um, we expected that to be A.J. Puck. Um, it has not been A.J. Puck. But through four starts, Ryan Weathers has a 270 ERA, um, a 135 whip. He has a 25% strikeout rate. His swinging strike rate is up to 13.2%. This is a guy who's now throwing uh, 96, averaging 96.1 on the fastball. He averaged 95 last year, even as a lever. Um, the stuff is playing up. He's coming off a start just last night against the Giants where he allowed five hits and two runs in six innings. He struck out 10 and walked one. Um, like, th that's great. Uh, his changeup was really good. Um, his, his sweeper looked really good. So I, like, kind of want to buy into this a little bit i mean he's pounding the zone well with with more velocity and a you know a five pitch arsenal of pitches um i don't necessarily think like this is the the makings of some fantasy ace but i do think that like ryan ryan weathers is a decent pitcher again son of a major league pitcher has major league uh you know baseball in his blood has a very like has a lot of command and presence on the mound um, I think he could stick in the rotation for a little while, and I think that he'll be startable against most offenses, but I don't know that you want to start him against like the top third offenses in baseball. But like the Giants aren't a terrible offense, and he dominated them. Um, you know, and so I think you can play him against most offenses right now. You like him a little bit more than I do. The walk rate's still high. All the ERA estimators, Sierra has him at 399, and everything else I looked at has him over four. I like that he's left-handed. I like that park at Chicago in his next start. That would be Sunday. I'd probably sit him there. He does get Washington yeah. next week, and then it might be a, a two-start step after that. So I'm. you should be aware of weathers. You should track weathers. I would not proactively add him as, maybe as eagerly as you would. 
I, I would be willing to add, but I think that because he has the Cubs next, like I think he could probably wait because I agree with you. I wouldn't start him there. Um, and so I think he could be available after that, and I would definitely like to take him for that that, that next matchup. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few relievers here. We don't have to go super in-depth on them, but it just felt like worth mentioning. Um, three guys, or the first two guys, I know we don't really need to talk about. Craig Kimbrell is up. His strikeout rate is up. Uh, 20.4%. Obviously, it's like, it's very early for relief pitcher samples. But I just think Craig Kimber has looked really good to start the year. And for some reason, he was an afterthought, even though he was going to Baltimore. Um, and he looks good. It's a good offense. Uh, you know, good team. You can't buy Craig Kimbrell, but he looks great right now. You and I have talked about Michael Kopech. His strikeout rate is up 14.1%. Uh, he looks good out of the bullpen. He will be a good reliever whether he sticks in the White Sox or gets traded. Um, Hunter Harvey of the Nationals, the strikeout rate is up 13.2%. Uh, um, he's a guy who I really like. I know Kyle Finnegan is, you know, holding that down right now. But I Harvey is like one of my bench stashes if I need a relief pitcher because uh, I, I really do believe that Hunter Harvey is probably the better pitcher of the two. And I don't – you know, he's giving you really good ratios and maybe we'll pick up saves at one point. Um, and then the last one, which I found interesting is uh, Fernando Cruz, who is a 34 year old um, on the Reds who was in, in their bullpen last year. Uh, he has a 51.7% strikeout rate so far this year. Uh, that is a 24% uh, increase in whiff, and he has a 24% increase in whiff rate, which is the most of any uh, pitcher at all in baseball, 245 ERA through seven and a third innings. But the reason I was including him on here is that when we do the decliners or the fallers, you'll see Alexis Diaz's name there. Um, he is, Alexis Diaz has lost a lot of whiff rate. So Cruz is somebody who's just interesting if we were to think that Diaz may slip up at some point in time. Uh, so those are the four relievers who popped. I don't know if you have anything to add about any of those guys. Well, you talked about Harvey. I mean, we One of the tenets of this whole fantasy thing is to chase skills, not roles. That's a Ron Chandler truism, and, and that would fall in with the Washington bullpen. And I, I don't know if he didn't have enough innings to qualify for your list. DJ's a big Mets fan. I, I just get to mention, you know, guy, you talk about guys come out of nowhere sometimes like, like Cruz has. Reed Garrett for the Mets. He's he's not going to close, right? Alexis Diaz has got that on lockdown. Garrett has eight and two thirds innings, four hits, no runs, three walks, seventeen strikeouts. He struck out six guys yesterday in two innings. That's like everybody. He all the outs he got were recorded by strikeout. Picked up a win. One of my favorite fantasy hacks is, and I always say this is why I don't try to draft like some of those. Um, fire breathing dragons before the season and relief. Cause I always feel like the Reed Garrett's of the world will come up and you can get them for zero dollar bids. You can get them as free pickups. They're, they're medium and deeper leagues. If you're in a more shallow format, you might not go for these players, but people say, Oh, my pitching staff, my ratios, I'm getting torched. How do you fix it? I'll tell you how you fix it. You find some relievers who are going yeah. to smooth out your ratios. And, and again, in, a, in some leagues, you won't need to go this deep. Cruz and Garrett won't be on your radar. I get it, but Anybody who has three walks and 17 strikeouts and eight and two-thirds innings, I'm interested. I don't care what the resume is. I don't care how bad they were with the Tigers or the, right. or the Nationals in previous steps. It doesn't matter to me. It's the Nick Anderson frame. These guys figure it out. They add a pitch. And, again, you're doing some great work with all this pitch mix stuff and, and all the you know granular analysis you do with it. But when I see that three and 17, man, I, I'm so glad that I have Reed Garrett on a couple of my teams. Yeah, it's also like you you mentioned the Nick Anderson thing. I mean, Robert Stevenson with the Rays mm -hmm. last year was an afterthought. Great example. And then was maybe the best reliever in baseball in the second half of the year. Um, and so those are, you know, those are some guys I would encourage people to pick up. There's a flip side of it um, with relievers that I'm a little concerned about. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, uh, can Nellie Corda continue her hot start and fend off the LPGA's finest at the Chevron Championship? Tune in this week for the first major of the season only on NBC and Peacock Saturday, 3 p.m., the Chevron Championship. Um, the flip side, obviously, the Fernando Cruz thing is that uh, Alexis Diaz has seen his whiff rate drop over 10%. Um, he has just seven strikeouts and five walks in six innings so far this year. Uh, he has a six ERA. Again, 
It's only six innings. Um, Alexis Diaz kind of came out of nowhere for us two years ago. Uh, but that's not to say he's going to, you know, he's a flash in the pan. Uh, but it is interesting to keep in mind at the start of the year, the, the struggles. Um, Tanner Scott's strikeout rate is down almost 16%. Uh, <clears throat> we've talked about his struggles with control. And then Rizal Iglesias's strikeout rate is also down almost 16% um, in the early going with the Braves. Again, these are very small sample sizes for relievers because most of these guys are throwing about, you know, six innings or have thrown about six innings so far this year. I'm just curious if you're at all concerned about any of Alexis Diaz, Rizal Iglesias, or Tanner Scott. I have levels of concern to all of them. I was actually surprised when Scott held on to get that save Tuesday. It was a three-run save, so he had some margin of error. He did get a couple of people on base. Eventually, all was well. Diaz was such a mess in the second half of last season. And, and I know like every season is different. And, you know, then there's a whole off season where they don't throw or they do different things. So maybe that isn't always a linear thing, but he makes me nervous. And the thing with Iglesias is that whenever a closer isn't pitching great on a team that just you know fancies itself a world series contender, obviously the Braves do. They're one of the best teams in baseball. This is why we reacted so quickly to the Leclerc news. I mean, the Rangers are the reigning world champions. They're not going to sit and watch this guy pitch poorly for two months. They have other guys in house. I'm not sold on the idea that I didn't draft Iglesias as like a no doubt. Okay. I got the Braves closer. You know, I won't worry about that for the rest of the year. I I've always thought he was okay. I never thought he was an elite reliever. And they have the resources to go out and improve that. But they've done it before. They've added pieces. And I can see like Kenley Jansen on this team in the middle of the season. I, Iglesias is somebody who concerns me because of the shape of the team and what their goals are. I haven't trusted Diaz for almost a year now. And, and I, Tanner Scott is not going to close all year for Miami. These are three guys I'm worried about. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, we're going to jump in here with some breaking news mm. uh, because we have to. We'll talk. We'll cut out maybe some of the guys we need to be concerned with. But the Padres um, have just put you Darvish on the IL, the 15-day IL with neck tightness. Um, he was slated to start this weekend. He now won't. He'll likely miss at least two turns in the rotation. Um, so Darvish on the shelf. Uh, we don't yet know who will take his spot. And then the Diamondbacks. Just transferred Eduardo Rodriguez to the 60-day injured list after he had a setback uh, with his lat while rehabbing. Um, that means he now is out for at least two more months. Um, I was already not really in on Eduardo Rodriguez. I think he can be dropped in pretty much all formats. Obviously, if you have an IL spot in an NL-only league, sure, go for it. Hold on to him. Uh, but I'm not in on Eduardo Rodriguez, especially – with him being out for months with a lat issue and then needs to build back up. You Darvish, um, he didn't look himself the last few starts. Hopefully it is just something related to this neck issue and he'll be fine in a couple of weeks. You're obviously not cutting him. You're putting him on the IL, uh, but more, more pitchers going down. I think it's safe to say Rodriguez has been overrated for most of his career. Detroit gave him the big contract and then I was surprised Arizona and I know pitching just so hard to find. But that contract really didn't make sense to me. And then, of course, he gets hurt and it looks worse now. And then he's had a setback. I, I have no expectations there. And I'm not I'm not saying anybody should cut Darvish. But my expectations, I think, are lower than yours are. His ERA was 4.56 last year, and he's into his age 37 season. He's not anywhere near the guy he used to be. He's just another pitcher no. right now. And not that anybody's picking him in the Cy Young. I get it. But right. – um, I will I, say I never wanted he had a bone, he had a bone spur issue mm -hmm. last yep, year. He did. Um, and so I expected better health this year, and I thought that would improve. Um, I do think like he's a little bit of we see this every year, like he throws seven pitches. And so sometimes it's figuring out what's working and what's not working. And mm -hmm. sometimes it takes him a little while. You know, he'll go through stretches in the season where he's like dominant, and then he has like a really bad three-start stretch because a couple of his pitches, the command of it is off and he's not recalibrating how he's attacking hitters. It's a little bit of like, he sometimes has too many pitches for his own benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I still like, obviously we'll wait to see if this neck injury is more serious than we let on. I don't, I don't anticipate it being, it's referred to as neck tightness in the IL designation, but I think this could be a decent time to like buy low on, on Darvish. If you can stash him, you know, on your bench when he's on the IL, because I really do think that he will be 
a top 30, 35-ish pitcher at the end of the year. Um, and if somebody is really down on him and now he's on the IL and you don't have to give up like a major asset to get Darvish, I, I think it could be a buying opportunity. So this show is, you know, we're friends. And even though we have, I think, a lot of different approaches in this game, uh, we often come to the same conclusions. There's a lot of agreement on this show. This is one thing we disagree with. When I look at Darvish's <laughs> resume, and, and he, oh, he's good. I mean, he came, I remember, you know, when he came over, it was such a big splash. And, you know, he struck out 221 his first season. He uh, he struck out 277, led the majors his second season. I remember once he was starting against Houston before the Astros fixed it. He was starting against Houston his first start of the year. And I said that night, I said, oh, it's like six hours until you Darvish is no hitter. And then Darvish retired the first 26 guys. There may have been a walk in there. And then he yeah. allowed a hit with with two outs in the ninth inning. I always just rue that would have been my best tweet ever, but nobody cares about that. <coughs> Here's the point I want to make. When I look at his resume, the pitcher he reminds me so much of is Steven Strasburg because the best of Darvish is a comet, is you know a 14 strikeout guy. But I feel like every year he needs maintenance. Every year he's going to miss four, five, six starts. Now, granted, in today's day and age, if you make 30 starts, we like that, but. I feel like the end result with him never adds up to how great his his raw stuff is. I feel like he's always going to be he's going to always going to look better in maybe stuff plus metrics or if you see him on the highlights on the right day, and maybe his fantasy value isn't commensurate with that. I've always felt again Strasburg's the comp for me. Strasburg was always good, but there's always maintenance involved. He was always break your heart at some point. That's kind of how I feel about Darvish. Uh Fair. I, we, I guess we'll see how it plays out at the at the end of the year. Um, one of the pitchers on this decreasing strikeout rate or whiff rate um, kind of ties into this injury because it's Kevin Gossman. Um, his strikeout rate is down 10.3% so far. We covered that he started the year um, you know, late with a shoulder injury. His velocity is down a little bit at the start. Um, his <laughs> Twitter and fastball are both getting hit hard. Um, it, it's tough right now because – it is really hard to distinguish between is he still hurt or is he just ramping back up again after starting the year hurt. And so, like, I understand there's a little bit of cause for concern. Um, you're obviously not dropping him because he's Kevin Gossman. You could opt to trade, but I don't know that you're trading from a point of strength and we're not trading with any clear information that says he's definitely worse or he's definitely hurt. It's just... We're uneasy because he hasn't looked good to start, and we're not sure. Really simple rule of thumb here. If you roster Gossman and you want to get out of the Gossman business, you just have to wait till he pitches well once or twice. Now, granted, he may do that, and you may have second thoughts about that, but he will eventually have a good start against somebody, and that's when. And again, I, we always talk about this. You don't say, hey, I want to trade Kevin Gossman. He just you know three hit the Royals. No, you, you <laughs> say, I, I have some good pitching depth. Hey, hey, Tony, you could use some pitching and let them come to Gossman and let them maybe, you know, have seen the recent start or two that was good. You, you have to wait till he turns it around if you want to trade him. At least the walk strikeout numbers are still very good in, in as a ratio. I mean, I realize the strikeout rate isn't where it normally is, but he's not right. walking guys and he's been, I mean, 406 Babbitt, but that's obviously been unlucky even with the line trade. Drive rate has earned some of that. It, it, that's in a really high area too. It's this sounds like a guy who's just not at his full speed yet. He's not. You know, he's ramping up. This I, I feel like Kevin Gossman will iron it out. Now, if I were redrafting him, I you know I probably wouldn't have the nerve to take him. But I have to. I, I'm going to say both. I'm going to play both sides of this. He's obviously a lot better than this. He's eventually going yeah. to go back to being. Uh, was well, ERA's been in the low to mid threes with Toronto? I, I would think the rest of the way it'd probably be about 340, 350, very playable with decent strikeout numbers. But if I rostered Gossman, I'd be waiting to get that on ramp of one or two good starts, and then I would try to quietly get out of the business. I agree on that. Um, baseball is such a funny sport because you've got the next guy on this list, Hunter Brown, whose strikeout rate is down 12.3%. We talked about him getting absolutely obliterated by the Royals. Um, two starts ago. And then what does he do last night? He goes out and faces the Atlanta Braves uh, and allows just two runs in six innings with six strikeouts, a 31% whiff rate, 
Uh, and all of a sudden you're like, that's a pretty, that was a pretty good performance. What the hell do we do? Um, and this is a little bit of like the Hunter Brown experience. I wrote heading into the year that he really tinkered with his pitch mix and with his like locations and stuff last year. It seemed like a young pitcher who hadn't yet really discovered how he wanted to attack major league hitters. I still don't know that he knows how he wants to attack major league hitters. Um, and so I think like, I think the truth of the matter is that the Royal start was like a worst case scenario. Just he didn't have his stuff. The Royals were hitting really well that game. Like it just was a bad outing. He wasn't that bad. But at the same time, like I know he looked great against the Braves. I don't know that I can start him in his next start against the Cubs. Like I, I, I probably would be holding him given what he just did, but I don't know that I can start him. I don't know if I missed this, but after that Royal start, I was just counting the seconds until somebody was saying he was tipping his pitches. When you see his walk rate is as high as it is, and yet his line drive rate is so good. Now, it wouldn't be an irony, somebody tipping their pitches who's a Houston pitcher, right? You can throw in your trash can right. jokes. But um, unfortunately, Brown has just too much pedigree and too much back class. Even, even the last year, you know, the ERA over five, that's terrible. But he, he pitched better than that as his ex-fit was in the mid threes. If although some people don't like that because it's, it's always a debate on our home runs, you know, largely random or our pitchers throwing meatballs that are getting hit out of the park. And I, I do think a stat like XFIP sometimes gives a pitcher an excuse that he doesn't deserve, but Brown's a tough call because he's too good to drop. And he's not right. Even with that good start against Atlanta, which I certainly didn't see coming. I thought the Braves were going to eat his lunch too, but uh, he's too good to, to drop, but not sure you can start him at the time he's all wrong for a trade. So he becomes forced hold. He's a forced hold right now, but somebody you can't play with any confidence. Yeah. And I realize that but is I, not a satisfying he, conclusion, but. Yeah. But I think you, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes the it's just, you want to make a move, but there's no move to make. And it's mm -hmm. important to understand there's no move to make. Um, we'll end with one last veteran pitcher. Um, it's Aaron Noah. On the surface, you're like, why is Aaron Noah on here? He has a 347 ERA through his four starts. Um, and well, his strikeout rate has dropped under 20%. Um, his swinging strike rate has dropped under 9% to 8.9%. Um, his whiff rate overall is down over 7%. Um, I, I think there are some concerns here. Um, you know, Aaron Noah is averaging under 91 miles an hour with his fastball. He was sitting 92.7 last year. Um, the fastball has never been his primary pitch, right? We know he kind of gets by off of his curveball. But it, you obviously notice when velocity dips like that. If Aaron Noah, who is you know throwing his curveball 30% of the time and his four-seam 30% of the time, if the four seam isn't working for him, he starts to get a little bit more into like Charlie Morton territory of an aging pitcher with a good curveball, but not much else in a who pitches in a hitter's park. And I'm not saying he is that, but I'm saying that I do have some concerns about the rest of Aaron Noah's arsenal here. And I know the last start was really good. It was against the Rockies at home. So um, like I, I, I like what he did. I don't want to overreact too much to it. The velocity was up in the last start and he was throwing the fastball up in the zone a lot more. So the fastball looked good in that start. It was the Rockies, but if we start to see the velocity up and the fastball up in the zone more in the next couple of starts, then I will, I will take a deep breath. Uh, I'm not panicking right now, but I'm, I am like. I want to be convinced he's fine and one more start could do it, but I'm not fully there yet. Here's where I'm concerned. Um, that major velocity. I know sometimes velocity dips can be part and parcel with April. So maybe we need a little bit more data before we take that at face value. But I mean, this has always been a guy who lived in the 90, you know, 92, 93 range. Now he's under 91 walk rate is up. Strikeout rate, which is never great to begin with, is down. And it's been an unbelievably fortunate strand rate that's kept the ERA where it is at 3.47, where all the estimators are you know, much higher than that. His FIP right now is 5.56. And he's a name. Aaron Nola is somebody. I talked about if you want to get out of the Gossman business, you get to time the market. 
I feel like Aaron Nola will have trade value at any point in time. So this is somebody who he's only 30. I, and man, when you mentioned the Charlie Morton comp, I mean, obviously Morton is at a different stage of his career, but I, yeah. I see it, man. You know, Morton is Morton is just all junk now. I mean, and, and he's fun to watch. I like Charlie Morton and um, he's always been like a good support starter. He's never really been an ace. I, I know the Phillies want Nola and Wheeler to be out at the front of their rotation as aces, I'm worried that Aaron Nola is going to be miscast as a one or a two when he's really like a three or a four the rest of his career. So he may, I am nervous here. Yeah. Um, we'll end the show with our, I told you we'd update you on Albert Suarez. <laughs> um, four and two thirds innings so far against the twins, two hits, no runs, four strikeouts. He has a 35% whiff rate. He has 10 whiffs on 25 swings with his four seam fastball. His four-seam fastball is uh, averaging 96 miles an hour. He touched 98 on the day. Um, again, mediocre Twins lineup right now. Uh, but this is something I'm sure people will dig into because, you know, it's a pretty good start through four and two-thirds innings. Good team context, good park. You know, again, I, I'm not rushing to pick him up in 12 team leagues, but if you're in deeper leagues and he could be even decent with the rest of the team context, um, it becomes a little interesting. So we'll, we'll dig in after the start. Um, I will, I'll tell you right now, I do a weekly video series I post on Twitter called Who's That Guy, where I do a, a quick video breakdown of somebody that most people haven't heard of. Uh, I promise you, either later today or tomorrow morning, I will do Who's That Guy for Albert Suarez. Um, so make sure you check that out uh, to get my thoughts on it. Yeah, what it might come down to is how the team feels about Cole over in long term or how quickly John Means can come back, who's deep into a rehab assignment and, and may pitch next week. But uh, as far as start, as you mentioned, all, all the numbers check out. And he doesn't have any walks either, which we love that as well. So, yeah, who's yeah. that guy? Uh, Suarez, I'm in. Let's let's talk about him. I'm looking forward to see what you come up with uh, later in the week. Yeah, you guys can check that out. I will post it on Twitter. I am at Twitter at. Samsky NYC. Scott is on Twitter at Scott underscore Pianowski. Uh, and we'll check you next week on another episode of the Roto World Fantasy Baseball Show.